We want to welcome back Lee Drutman. He is a senior fellow at the Sunlight Foundation. Good morning. Thanks very much for being with us. Hey, thrilled to be here this Sunday morning. Let's talk about legislation because we've been hearing this line that it's the, the least effective Congress, the fewest number of bills signed in modern times, and yet you have a somewhat different take on what Congress did or did not do. How so? Well, Congress introduced, the, didn't pass a lot of bills, certainly. 56 bills in the first session of, of Congress is, the, is, is a modern record low for, for a Congress in terms of passing bills. But members of Congress introduced 5,584 bills. So members of Congress are, are coming up with legislation. They're just not getting it passed. How many bills did the House pass? How many did the Senate pass? House passed 40, 41 bills that originated in the House passed. 15 bills that originated in the Senate passed. And how does that compare to past years? Past years? That's, that's low. I mean, it's, it's, it, is, it is record low in terms of, of bills, bills passed. Um, and, and even those bills that passed, I, I pulled out a few of the bill, na the, the, the names of the bills that, that passed. So, so, so actually, it was a good, good year for baseball fans because uh, Congress did pass a bill that, that specifies the size of precious metal blanks that will be used in the production of National Baseball Hall of Fame commemorative coins, so that's important work that Congress is doing. Also, the uh, interstate, this big, interstate Route 70 bridge over the Mississippi River, which connects St. Louis, Missouri, and southwestern Illinois, is now the San, Stan Musial Veterans Memorial Bridge. So, so that's some of what the, the actual... So when, you, when we actually say 56 bills, some of it is, is actually... A fair amount of it is, is actually these sort of... Uh, what, what some might call trivial... Legislation. How else do you gauge the productivity of Congress? Well, I mean, so there's a number of ways. You, you can look at what congressional offices actually introduced, right? So, so uh, like I said, I mean, 56 passed, but almost 5,600 bills are introduced. You know, members of Congress, their the, 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 the role is not only to pass legislation, but to hold hearings to debate issues, to do constituent service. I mean, if you look at where House offices are allocating their resources, now almost half of the staff are, are back home in the district. So some of that is, is constituent service. Uh, members of Congress weigh in. They come on, talk on, on programs like this and debate issues. Um, so, I mean, I mean, legislation is one way, and we tend to focus on legislation as the only thing that, that Congress does. But Congress is, you know, members of Congress are, are, uh, have, have, have many different responsibilities and roles. I want to put on the uh, screen just a couple of graphs to kind of put this in perspective. Yeah. And what I, what I find most interesting is what bills became law in 2013 and who wrote them. Uh, leading the list, transportation, public works, public lands bills, armed forces, health, in government operations, at the bottom of the list, education, finance, and immigration. Yeah. So, and those are the those are the subject headings of, or those are the, what what Congressional Research Service gives as uh, subjects, right? I mean, so so some of those bills at the top, public lands. I mean, some of that is ceremonial. Um, you know, I mean, what, what's also interesting is when you look at the bills that that Congress introduced, and we have a, another chart as well. Um, which, you know, I mean, so a lot of what Congress is, is trying to legislate on health is, is, is number one, um, armed forces, national security, taxation, public lands, government operations and politics, education. What Congress is not introducing legislation on uh, civil rights and liberties and minority issues, families, social welfare, and, and the bill that gets one, only one introduction, social sciences and, and, and history, which was a bill introduced by uh, Gerald Nadler. Democrat of New York, which was to establish an African burial ground, international memorial museum, and educational center in New York, New York, New York City, and for other purposes. I don't know what the other purposes are, but did not pass. Our conversation with Lee Drutman, and as always, we welcome you to join in. Our phone lines are open. You can also send us an email at journal at cspan.org or send us a tweet at cspanwj. How else? Do you gauge the productivity of Congress? If not through passing a bills, what else do you look at? Well, like I said, I mean, you can look at, you know, our, our, our congressional office is coming up with ideas for legislation. Um, are they introducing bills? Are they holding hearings? Certainly they're holding a lot of hearings. Are they, are they serving their constituents? Um, you know, I mean, a fair amount of what Congress does is, is, is constituent service, especially these days. Um, you know, I mean, uh, Certainly, certainly not. I mean, certainly Congress is the, the legislative 
branch of the government, and their role is primarily to legislate. So if they're not passing legislation, then generally think of them as, as not being very productive. But individual members of Congress, I mean, there, there's sort of this idea of Congress as an it versus Congress as a they, right? So there's 535 individual members of Congress who are come to Washington, I, I presume, because they, they have things that they want to get done. Uh, they have ideas about legislation they'd like to pass, and, and you know they, they are working through these ideas, and they are dropping bills and sometimes getting hearings on them. But as an institution, it's clear that Congress is not passing legislation. They will be in session 114 days this year. Do you know how that compares to... It's pretty, pretty darn low. I mean, I mean, right. I mean, they're, they're not in session as much as they have been historically. And that's... And in part because, I mean, the, the, I mean so much of, particularly in the House, um, so much of, of, the, of what comes is, is driven by the, by the leaders. And, and the leaders know that, that there's not a ton of stuff that has, can, that, that has consensus that, can, that, that, that Republicans in the House want to pass, that can pass through the Senate and be signed by the President, or in the Senate, that the Senate Democrats want to pass that will be passed by the House Republicans. Um, you know... And so, frankly, I mean, I mean, also, frankly, you know, uh, election uh, campaigning has, has come to dominate governing in the modern Congress. And so when they're not in Washington, they're home in the district doing meet and greets. And, and frankly, uh, uh, as part of campaigning being more important, fundraising has become more important. So they're spending a ton of time fundraising. And, you know, frankly, the when you look at what they're introducing and you look at what the topics are that draw the most bill introductions, those happen to, to correlate with a lot of the, the interests that are spending the most money. So one, other, I mean, one reason why members of Congress introduce legislation is because somebody asked them to, particularly somebody who, who is, is a, a campaign contributor or, or, or a lobbying industry with a big presence in their district or their state. This is from Ken Weiss, who says on our Twitter page, why is Senator Reid the least productive U.S. Senate leader in history? First of all, would you agree with that assessment? Why or why not? Well, I, I think it's, it's hard to, to, to put so much on Senator Reid. I mean, he's working, with, uh, he, he's working in a Congress that's incredibly divided, and that partisan gridlock... Uh, it is a reason why very little passes. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, even if you put Lyndon Johnson at the at the head of the Democrats in 2013, I don't even I don't know if if if, if even LBJ, who you know, the supposed master of the Senate, would would be as productive as he was when he was, in fact, in the Senate. And Probably it, not nearly. I mean, so so I, I don't think it's fair to blame Harry Reid. I think the the institutional dynamics of Congress now are, are at fault. And this is another point of view, says we don't want Congress always sticking its nose into our business and quote unproductive Congress is a good Congress. Sure, I mean that's, that's the, old, the old Jeffersonian philosophy of the government that, that governs best is the government that governs least. Um, but I mean the, the, the question that, that you would ask then is you know are there issues that Congress ought to be dealing with that they're not. I mean, if, if you believe that government shouldn't be doing anything, um, but the truth is that government is doing things, right? I mean, you have a, a vast federal uh, rulemaking procedure. I mean, hundreds, thousands of, of rules are, are being made. It's just that Congress isn't making them. They, I mean, you look at Dodd-Frank, ACA, I mean, there's been a tremendous delegation to the agencies to write rules, and so rules are being made. Maybe Congress isn't writing them right now, but government is, is, is doing things. Our guest is Lee Drutman. He is a graduate of Brown University and earned his doctorate from UC Berkeley. He is part of the Sunlight Foundation. You can log on at sunlightfoundation.com to get more information. What's the mission statement of your organization? Well, the Sunlight Foundation, we, we promote transparency in government. We believe that technology has an important role to play in that. We 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 want government to be open and transparent, and, and we believe that that will make citizens more engaged and make government more accountable to the people. Another point of view from Kiki, who tweets in regularly, saying, "You don't see Mitch McConnell putting a hold on everything?" Question mark. Four hundred filibusters. Well, that that's also a reason why it's uh, it's very hard to get things. That's a good point. 
Um, I mean, when you have one party that is, is incredibly obstructionist, I mean, what's, what's the point of trying to bring legislation forward at some point? Right? I mean, it also prevents legislation from coming forward, right? So, I mean, th there's a lot of opposition, very strong opposition to a lot of bills coming forward. Let's go to Eric, joining us from Seattle, Washington, Democrats line. Good morning. Uh, good morning. You, you know, uh, what, really what, what, what I would like you to uh, speak on is this, about that budget. And uh, uh, the budget, which, which, which we are seeing, is basically the same budget that was brought out during uh, Bill Clinton's time. It was a Tea Party budget. Uh, Newt Gingrich and Dick Armey put a budget on the floor. This is what caused all the problems to start to begin it. Uh, when we went from a surplus to deficit spending. Also, George Bush did not put the war spending. He had what's called a supplemental budget. When President Obama became the president, he put this on online. So basically what you are having is this, and also Dick Cheney said deficits don't matter. Deficits don't matter as long as a Republican is the president. Deficits matter when a Democrat becomes president because this is also point two of the Grover Norquist plan that says that if we will not let a Democratic president govern as a Democrat. So the, basically what we are going through, it's history if you look back on it. They do this every time when a Democratic president gets in office. The economy goes good. The deficit begins to shrink. And my father, I would like to end with this. Ted Cruz was born in Canada on socialized medicine. Why is he the one who is carrying this bounty. You people need to bring this out and question him about socialized medicine, which allowed him and his father, Raphael Cruz, to be born, but they always want to say socialized medicine. Thank you. Okay, Eric, thank you for the call on his first point. And his first point uh, about the budget, sir, um, I mean, look, um, you know, it, it, yeah, I mean there there was a there was a surplus during during the, the Clinton years. The economy was very good. Came a deficit during the Bush years. The economy was poor. There was a lot of military spending. Uh, now things are, are sort of swinging back in the in the from the deficit. It seems to be on the decline as the economy gets better, as government spending comes down a little bit. I mean there are there are a lot of. I mean actually, I mean I, one one thing that's interesting in the in the, the study that we did is we looked at the at different areas of legislation and we found that the economics and uh, and, and budget issues were were the most polarized issues based on on co-sponsorships so clearly there there's a, a you know i think he point the, the, you know eric points to a, a lot of a lot of uh a lot of political conflict over over budget and and finance issues um and, and you know i think that's certainly real and important um Okay, we'll go to Deb from Plymouth, Wisconsin, Democrats line with Lee Drutman of the Sunlight Foundation. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I got just a couple comments for C-SPAN and then a question. Um, one, I'd really love to see a show on the, the lies that are being put forth on Glenn Beck on Common Core. Um, I really am glad you mentioned his, uh, the Sunlight Foundation. I'd love to for you to for every guest to talk about how the people are funded, and then my question is, um, sorry, I was on the treadmill. <laughs> uh, how many of the over five thousand bills that have introduced do you uh, rate them as far as whether they're just obstructionist fluff or whether they're actual out there actually trying to accomplish something? Deb, thanks for the call. We'll let you get back to your treadmill, and you can listen to the answer. Thank you. All right. So on, on the, the treadmill of legislation, um, right? So so question is, you know, five, you know, fifty fifty six hundred bills. How much are just pure obstructionism? Um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I think obstructionism is is a tactic. I mean, a lot of these bills, some of these bills are are just trivial bills, like you know, to designate the the, the bridge over the Mississippi River, the Stan Musial Veterans Memorial Bridge. Um, but look, I, I think if you go to Congress and you decide to, to go through the whole rigmarole to, to get into Congress and, and stay in Congress, you, you have certain ideas about what you'd like to see, what you'd like to see the government do, and you have allies and, and constituents and interest groups and campaign funders who have ideas about what you should do. So I, I mean, I, th I think most a fair amount of these these bills that are introduced are, are genuine ideas about what. Congress 
should do. Uh, you know, I, I don't think a lot of them are just pure obstructionism, but but you know, certainly certainly Republicans in particular have used obstructionism as a tactic to stop bills from coming forward. Lee Drutman is the co-author of a study available online at the Sunlight Foundation website titled Why Congress Might Be More Productive and Less Partisan Than You Think. I also want to share with you another headline from National Journal. Congress has its lowest output since 1947. Congress closing the year with 58 bills enacted into law, the tiniest fraction of the 6,366 bills introduced by lawmakers. Again, that story available online at nationaljournal.com. David is joining us from London, England. This program is carried live Sunday mornings on the BBC Parliament Channel. We welcome you to the conversation. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good morning there. It's a great topic. A lot of American expats here and all over the world, we, we often find ourselves having to defend a, a, the legislative branch of the United States, regardless of our, of our political leaders. I wonder if we could talk about the perception issue, the, how the image of the legislative branch in America has been damaged by this Congress. Because, I, for example, the best example I can give you, you touched on it briefly, was this, this Congress's obsession with repealing the Affordable Care Act. The core issue that, that folks on, on the Republican side of the aisle always cite is, 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 is the individual mandate. That came out of the Heritage Foundation. It's a conservative idea. And yet, it seems all other business of government has been stopped under this, I, I guess, a, a friend of mine who actually is a member of the British Parliament referred to it as a fetish that, that the, the Republicans in Congress have with repealing the Affordable Care Act. And many people here ask me, what is wrong with your Congress? And I'm, I'm just wondering if you could speak about that perception issue and how, how the reputation of, of our system of government, the three branches, has been damaged by the lack of productivity by this Congress. Thank you. Well, I mean, if you look at polling on approval of Congress, I mean, it, it, it's not that it's not just this Congress. I mean, it's been it's been declining for a while. I mean, it's been in the twenties and the teens for 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 almost a decade now. So, why does Congress have such a low approval rating? I mean, one reason is that everyone loves to blame Congress, including members of Congress. So, starting probably around the eighties, you started to see members of Congress running against the institution. They say, look. You know, government doesn't work, but elect me to Congress, right? And so there's been this sort of way in which people in in government run against government. Uh, so I think a lot of that has contributed, and you know, you and and more and more you have people who are going to to Washington who you know basically are using that as a platform to say Washington doesn't work, but somehow so there's sort of this. this I mean, I think there's sort of this strange. Disconnect, and that that sort of feeds on the cynicism of of people that, that well, oh, government doesn't work because people are going to Washington who don't really want government to work. Um, you know, as for this this question of of Obamacare, I mean, it's, it has become a matter of of, of faith, I think, in, in a good portion of the Republican Party that that this is the single most important issue. We have to stop this issue. Everything has to be. Uh, be sublimated to that, and, and I, you know, I, I think, it, I mean, it's interesting to hear uh, from across the pond this idea of, of a fetish. Um, you know, so, I mean, I think a lot of people in this, in this, you know, here, here, here in the states would would recognize uh, that as well, uh, certainly, um, as, as uh, in a similar way. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it's not. I mean, the larger point is, I, I think it's not an, a new, a new issue with this Congress that that. People don't think that that the legislative branch works. I mean, people have been writing about this for 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 more than a decade now. One of our viewers, and we're going to be focusing more on this, by the way, uh, at the bottom of the hour with Eric Hansen. But if you want to touch on this, how many earmarks were in that 1.1 trillion dollar budget that was passed in the House and Senate last week? Do you have any insight? Um, well, certainly when you have a bill that's 1,500 pages long, there are going to be a lot of provisions inserted that benefit narrow interests. I mean, look, I mean, I think that's one of the larger problems with how Congress operates now is that basically the, the entire regular order has broken down and now you're essentially passing these giant omnibus bills. And when you have giant omnibus bills, it's a lot easier for individual special interests to get 
favor uh, friendly members to stick provisions in and nobody uh, you know nobody's going to read the whole darn bill uh so until it you know it's only only after the bill is passed that people start and say oh well, this looks a little suspicious so the truth is i i think i don't think we'll know for a little while i mean officially the republicans killed earmarks uh but there, there are ways in which provisions still get in that benefit very narrow interests. Or, so. And by the way, if you're interested at the whitehouse.gov website, there is a complete list of all the signed legislation from 2013. Lee Drutman is our guest from the Sunlight Foundation. We're focusing on what Congress did and did not accomplish last year and what to expect in 2014. Mike from Janesville, Wisconsin, Independent Line. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Um, really enjoy your show, and it, uh, I would love to hear comments uh, from Lee about uh, gerrymandering, um, especially comments like uh, the old politician Tom DeLay and did uh, Barack Obama also use that as far as their high technical skills and understanding of the electorate and, um, you know, versus I, I come from a city that has a... a, a uh, city council form of government, so there's not in laid out territories, and so our our government, our city government, is governed. Uh, if you get elected there, the whole community elects you. And I thought, boy, you know, I'm, I know gerrymandering has been around forever, uh, but it seems like it's to a heightened, uh, you know, science right now. And it, uh, I just wonder what your thoughts are uh, and comments on how is it poisoning the system or what do you think? Thank you, Mike. And also the other point is that uh, based on Charlie Cook and Stu Rothenberg, there are really only a handful of truly competitive house races because, as he pointed out, the way these districts are drawn. Yeah, I mean, some of the, all right, I mean, so gerrymandering, right, I mean, has been around. The, the, the name gerrymander is named for Elbridge Gerry, who was actually going back to, to really the, the, the earliest days of the Republic. Um, and you know the question is it getting worse i mean look there there are a lot of safe seats in the house in part that's because uh, but that there there are there are big regional differences between where republican voters are 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 living and where democratic voters are living i mean in so you know tends to be urban areas tends to be heavily democratic rural areas tend to be heavily republican so that accounts for a lot of it as for Gerrymandering. I mean, certainly both uh, both parties are guilty of trying to shape districts in ways that uh, that benefit them to maintain the, the maximum number of seats, and they go back and forth every ten years, and a little bit here, a little bit there, and there are some districts that have shapes that are that are very funny looking. Um, I mean, the question is, it poisoning? I mean, so so there's sort of. And a lot of people have have argued that gerrymandering has increased polarization by increasing the number of safe districts. Um, but actually, the political science on that suggests that that's not actually really a cause, because if that were the case, you would expect polarization to be much worse in the House than in the Senate. And that's not actually the case. Um, you know, I mean, the other thing with gerrymandering is you is you're actually trying to spread your voters out. So you're actually want, the best way to gerrymander is to is to kind of get these these districts that are like 55 percent your your party. You actually don't want super safe seats because you want to be able to spread your voters out. So in that case, it, it should actually gerrymandering should make districts a little bit more competitive if it's if it's done in a partisan way, um, which you know which at may actually hurt Republicans down the road as the demographics shift and, and, and increase the number of Democratic voters in the population. But for now, it seems to have helped Republicans in the current current configuration of, of House seats. One other note from gov in addition to the bill signed, the executive orders by the president, and there are more than a dozen pages on the website with a complete list of all the executive orders. Joy makes this point. Again, you can follow us at c WJ on our Twitter page. Do we need a more productive Congress or just one that works on behalf of the American people? Quality versus quantity. John from Panama City, Florida, Independent Line. Good morning. I don't know why they get that zip code and always messed up. 33401 is West Palm Beach, but it's okay. I can be from Panama City. I apologize, um, but you're on no, the No, it's okay. Group. 
It's okay. Every time I call them, they say Panama City. But anyway, um, I think it's great that uh, this Congress is not productive. I mean, what does that word mean, productive? Uh, if you look at all the stacks and stacks of volumes of past laws, I mean, nobody even reads this. I mean, Mr. Drutman just said it. I mean, they don't, they don't even read it before they pass it. In the famous words of Nancy Pelosi, you know, we have to pass it before we know what's in it. I mean, it's a joke. I mean, they're, they're passing laws that are already on the books already. If somebody bother and go back and look at 1953 or 1964 and what they passed already. I think it's great that they're not productive. I don't want them to be productive because the more they pass, the more they intrude in my life. Um, I have to go back, though, to a previous caller because this is, you call yourself the Sunlight Foundation, but you don't really explain back in uh, the 90s when, you know, Clinton had these surpluses. He didn't have surpluses. In fact, Clinton never proposed a budget because that's all the president can do is propose a budget. Uh, he never proposed a budget that balanced uh, the budget. And the only reason why there was one year, I know there's four years where you can look at, but there was, was only actually one year that we had a surplus, was because uh, the other three years that they said we had a surplus, they used the Social Security uh, Trust Fund, which was put online uh, under LB 60s to help uh, hide the cost of the Vietnam War. Uh, so there was only one true year, and that, that true year was only because of the dot-com bust that uh, Bush inherited. And the Federal Reserve, of course, under uh, Bush, created the bubble, the housing bubble. So, you know, if you want to get into sunlight, you really have to explain what happened in the 90s if you want to talk about surpluses. Thank you. John, thank you. Lee Drotman, your response. All right. So, I mean, we could, you know, have a debate about accounting. And, and I mean, frankly, I mean, the other thing... To, we tend to ascribe deficits and surpluses to, to presidents. Really, uh, presidents don't have a particularly important role in, in deficit or, or, or surplus. A lot of it has to do with the economy. And, and again, you know, as, as, as John pointed out, it, it, it's Congress who ultimately decides on the budget, right? So it's not the, the, pre the president has a role in, in suggesting, but it, it's ultimately Congress. But we tend to view government through the lens of whoever is the president because Congress is 435 people, and many people don't even know who their own member of Congress is. Um, you know, as for, I mean, this is a, this is a, a a persistent, you know, this is John is now the second caller to to raise this issue of well, maybe we don't want government to be legislating as much. I mean, Joyle said quality versus quantity, right? I mean, so so you know, if if you're producing stuff that that's pointless or counterproductive or meaningless, then maybe you shouldn't be producing anything. Um, but you know, again, I mean, there's a lot of different differing views on. What Congress should be doing, what what uh, what what would be quality legislation, what would be not so quality legislation, um, and you know, that's that's sort of beyond the purview of the, the study that, that that we did. I mean, that gets into philosophical questions, policy questions, uh, role of government questions that I, I don't think minds are going to be changed about. We're looking at uh, the productivity or lack thereof of Congress, depending, depending on how you define productivity. Lee Drutman is joining us from the Sunlight Foundation. There's uh, this comment from Denny Brown, who says on our Twitter page, gerrymandering is a failure to our Republican system, small r. It only serves the parties, not the people. John is joining us from Christiansted in the U.S. Virgin Islands, our line for Republicans. Good morning. Uh, thank you for for uh, putting on the show. As always, I, I enjoy C-SPAN and, and their coverage. Um, if the infrastructure bill would get passed, I believe that obviously we would be. It would not be a Democrat or a Republican issue. It would be a jobs issue, which is what America and I believe most voters did when they voted these folks to go to Congress and work on our behalf, because this would definitely deal with unemployment the way it should be dealt, which is by employment. And thank you very much. Thank you, John. We'll go on for another comment with Camille joining us in Berlin, Maryland. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's okay. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Uh, I want to preface this by saying I'm 82 years old, and it seems to me that over the years, it's a lot of the same old, same old. And... Um, over the years, what I have voted for is the person 
and listen to the person, not the party. And I think that in this cycle, though, we have become more and more polarized. And in the last couple of cycles, and frankly, I think I, the best over the years that I've seen is when the uh, presidency is one party and the legislature is of another party. They seem to temper each other better. And But we need, as voters, to get people who are reasonable and who are thoughtful of the whole country as a whole. And that's about all I really have to say. But... Uh, well, Camille, thank you for watching. We appreciate it. We'll get a response. Lee Drutman to uh, her comment and the previous caller, your thoughts. Yeah, so I, uh, Camille expresses a preference that I, I think it actually has has historically been a preference that a lot of Americans have had for divided government, this idea that, that you have one president of one party, Congress of another party, and they'll sort of find some compromise. I mean, look, this is a fundamentally... American Madisonian idea that, that faction should counteract faction and that you have differing viewpoints and that out of those differing viewpoints there's a, a, a dust up and a scuffle and out of that comes something resembling the the public interest and, and, the, and one of the challenges of that is uh, is in the current system you know I think the the, the parties are very the, particularly the leadership of the parties are just very far apart and very interested in, in scoring political points compromise particularly uh, on on the on the, the political right is seen as a dirty word um, so it's it's hard to do that when compromise is not held as, as the the highest good you know, let, I, I, let me follow up on that point because is, is it different between the rank and file house and senate members versus the leadership um, I, I mean, I think the uh, well, I, mean, I think the, the leadership has a has a particular role in maintaining uh, has a very strong role in, in maintaining the majority of the party, and so they want to draw clear differences. I, you know, the rank and file, I, I think, want to stay in power as well, and, and that are largely polarized as well. And in some cases, even even more so than the leadership. Um, but I mean, the, the the a lot of a lot of the process is really driven by the leadership in both parties. I think, and you know that's, and they have a very strong interest in, in maintaining power. Another look at the numbers, courtesy of the Sunlight Foundation, which Lee Drutman works for. In the House of Representatives in 2013, 3,750 bills introduced, 41 House bills became law. In the U.S. Senate, 1,800 bills introduced, 15 became law. There's this from Danny who says, Congressmen are not losing value. We little people have. No one cares. Javier is joining us from New Rochelle, New York. Democrats line. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. I just want to give my point of view. I'm a documentum from Mexico. But I know I know a lot about um, politics, and I see you on channel every morning. Yes, I just want to make a point of view about the Tea Party. You no, know, the party has been making a lot of damage to the to the Congress. But uh, I'd like to warn uh, all the citizens of the United States about the Cubans, about the Cruz and Rubio and Ileana Ross Lettin. Like, like she was in the Spanish Channel the other day, like with white bear. She looks so tough. She will say like. Enemies, they are enemies in the Congress, and they're not going to do nothing. And John Boehner is on their side. And i like to know everybody. What I think is that there is the problem. The Cubans, they want to do, they want to do what they want to do to Castro and the people over there, because they're not allowed to return. They want to do it to our people, to Spanish people, to Latinos. And they just, they just don't going to do nothing good for for this country, I want... Javier, I'm, I, I'm going to have him respond. A quick question for you, though. You've been in this country again how long? I've been over here 30 years, but I, I've never been allowed to get papers because it's so tough to get them. And you are, you, are you worried in any way about being deported, or do you feel you're you're pretty safe here at the moment? Mm, I don't care about being deported. The longest I'm to be deported to Mexico, I, I never do nothing wrong. I've been... No, I'm pretty safe. Uh, I I think uh, if they deport me to Mexico, it's okay. 
Okay. The law is a department to the country. Well, thank but you for... Thank you for taking my call. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to phone, and we appreciate it. From New Rochelle, New York, Lee Drutman. Um, so, I mean, there's certainly, certainly immigration issues are, are, are hot issues. Uh, I mean, there's, there's been talk about an immigration bill for a year now. Um, or, I mean, there is an immigration bill that's been talked about passing immigration for a year. I mean, these are... Uh, there's a. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure what I can add to to, to this, this question. I mean, it's certainly certainly a hot and lively issue, um, and something that Congress has really struggled with because I think there are a lot of you know a, a lot of re House Republicans who who have a lot of pressure from the Tea Party and from conservative anti-immigration groups who to, to to not pass legislation, and they don't see any real incentive in 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 going against those groups who are often active in the primaries. Let me follow up uh, on two points. First of all, this tweet from one of our viewers, how much money do we have to borrow to pay for the new $1 trillion spending bill? And we'll look at a far larger number from usdebtclock.org, which is where the nation's debt stands at the moment, $17.3 trillion. And then the larger question is, how much all of this drives the debate here in Washington? Certainly, uh, I mean, issues of, of debt and, and, and spending are, are, have, have really dominated the Congress. Um, you know, I, think, I think, you know, there was, there was government shutdown over this issue. Uh, so, so certainly a lot of people are mindful of this. Um, I mean, the Republican Party has, has really made government spending an issue. Um, you know, and, and you know, again, there. As I point back to, to the study, we found that that economics and, and, and budget issues are are at least based on on co-sponsorship of bills are the most polarized issue. And as that's a very important issue in Congress, the fact that it is so polarized has has kind of made it difficult for Congress to to, pro to make any progress on this on these issues, which is why there was a government shutdown. From Camilla, Georgia, Herbert is on the phone. Democrats line. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I was listening. We, we, when I joined the military, we um, took an oath that we're going to protect this country. And as Americans, is this an insult to every person who died in, in the wars? Because we got these politicians that took an oath, you understand me, to represent the people. When we went there, we didn't go as a Republican or Democrat. We put our lives on the line. And if we didn't do that, we got far, got out of there. That's what they need to do to the Republicans and Democrats. And then we have back again the American people and looking out for the interests of the American people. Charles Grassley sit right here and said that he receiving um, Social Security. Plus, he getting money off the farm deal. But he's collecting our money also. And and they get and they family getting health care. We paying for this, and we need to think about this, man. Everybody in America, we the one Republican and Democrat. We the one who getting screwed. We paying the same gas prices. We paying the same grocery prices. Things going up, and the rich you don't see is dwindling down because this their money have increases and wild decrease. When they gonna come? They need to have ethic rules. I retired up in Camilla. I was from uh, Miami. They had at the rule. They said anybody who's working for the county, their family member cannot be doing business with the county. They need to do the same thing with those politicians. Those bills that's being passed, they need to find out how many of their family members are benefiting out of those bills that's being passed. Herbert, thanks for the call. We appreciate it. All right. So, I mean, a couple of things uh, expressed, I, I think. You know, one is is this idea that we're all Americans and Republican, Democrat, and, you know, people. That's that's not what really matters. I mean, this is what you know. Barack Obama said in his in his 2004 Democratic National Con Convention speech. Um, you know, and, and I think it, it taps into kind of a, a deep feeling that a lot of people have that we should put these partisan differences. Aside, I mean, in in Washington, you know, people kind of live in a bubble, I think, and, and there's you know very much a my team versus your team kind of competitive spirit here that that kind of undermines that sense of of, of larger, you know, we're we're all Americans, we're all in this together, you know. As as for 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 concerns about ethics, you know, I, I uh, you know, I mean, I think a lot of a lot of what is is 
it was hampering Congress from from getting legislation passed is more about the these partisan differences than uh, than, than than ethical issues. Um, you know, I mean, look, I, I think a lot of uh, you know, you know uh, actually, I'm, I'll stop there. Okay, I just uh, want to remind our audience that we're ha we're talking with Lee Drutman. He is a senior fellow at the Sunline Foundation here in Washington D.C., and we're looking at Congress, its mm -hmm. productivity in 2013, and what to expect this year. Ron makes this point more on spending, saying. The budget increases in the 2014 uh, spending plan. Sequester is the best thing that Obama has done. No wonder he and the Dems wanted it killed. Do you want to comment? Sequester is... Wait, I'm trying to... He's saying follow, sequester was the best thing that Obama has done. Of course, it was something that was forced on him. But oh, okay. it's, something, it's no wonder that the Democrats want to see this killed. Um, well, I, you know, I, I don't... I'm not. I'm not sure how to how to respond to this. You know, I mean, again, I, I, I you know, I think one of the things we keep com coming back to this this issue of of the budget and the finance. And I think this is an issue that really, really animates people. And, and you know, again, you know, it, it's it, it fits with what we found in the study that that it is the most polarized issue of all the issues in Congress. And you know, often the issues that are the most polarized are the issues that that people are most interested and intense about one of the things that political scientists have found is that the more you you know about an issue the more polarized you are or the more you know about government generally the more polarized your your political views are, are likely to be and i think that would hold true for particular issues on that point of polarization another viewer has this roger ailes is the most polarizing individual in america let's go to rocky from san lorenzo california good morning yeah, good morning. Uh, when the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell came out after President Obama got elected the first time and said his number one goal was to make him a one-term president, well, I think that pretty much set the tone as far as nothing's going to get done and that the Republican Party doesn't really care about the country. They just want Obama to fail. And basically, if Obama fails, the country fails. And I think they really want that. All they care about is getting the presidency back, and at any cost, any cost. Thanks for the call. Yeah, I mean, I, I think McConnell's uh, famous statement about wanting Obama to be a one-term president was one of those 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 lines that gets repeated often because I think it it taps into a, a this you know this very you know very very competitive spirit. I mean, competitive would be would be an understatement, but I mean there. That that it, it's a it's a battle for for control and it's a partisan battle for control, particularly at the the top top levels of of the of the parties. And McConnell, you know, he, he wants Republicans to be in charge. He wants Obama to be a one term president, and he's going to use the the powers that he has in the Senate to to try to block the Democratic agenda. We'll go to Linda next from Churchville, Maryland. Good morning. Thanks for waiting. Republican line. Good morning, and thank you for taking my call. I uh, wanted to let the C-SPAN know that I do watch, and I love each and every one of you for bringing things forward, and I listen to a lot of this. But I want the government to know that the American people are willing to help in any way, but our federal government has gotten way too big, and they have taken so much away from the American people. Why can't we, I'm calling our governors of each state to take more control. By law, we, the people, are the fourth part of the government. If we could take more control back and stop this uh, bipartisan fighting in the, the uh, uh, federal government, uh, uh, this uh, uh, stimulating... Um, simulatable developments and stuff like this that they're implementing, uh, you know, we need to know. They need to come forward and be clean with the American people. Linda, thanks for the call. And a related note from one of our viewers saying productivity in D.C. should be in effective solutions to real problems, not in legislation passed and money spent. Um, so let me respond. I mean, this, you know, this question of effective solutions to real problems. I mean, that, that, that you know, that actually sounds like Washington speak to me. I mean, the question is, is how 
how, how would you measure that, right? I mean, how, how would you know what effective solutions are? How would you know what real problems are? And that, yeah, that, that's what people in this, in this town spend countless hours debating. What are the most important problems and, and how should we solve them, right? I mean, so if you look at what, if you look at the bills that Congress is introducing, uh, you can get a sense of what, what, what they think the problems are. Health is, is number one, armed first forces and national security, followed by taxation, public lands, natural resources, government operations and politics, and education. Those are the six most, um, you know, all, all with, with over 300 bills introduced. But, you know, I mean, argue, you know, one, one might think that, well, you know, families, social welfare, those are, those are real issues that are hitting people. So Congress only introduced 31 bills related to families, 66 bills related to social welfare. So, so one question, are the priorities of Congress trying to deal with the, the, the actual problems that, that most people face, um, you know, that's that's uh, you can look at at what you know. I mean, people have looked at at the congressional agenda uh, and the the public agenda, and they they find an incredible uh, uh, incredible low correlation between the issues that Congress is is dealing with and the issues that are the most important uh, problem that that American people say government should deal with. Um, you know, as as for effective solutions, you know. That's that's a, a harder question, but certainly there are a lot of people who who spend a lot of time in Washington trying to think about what effective solutions would be. Problem is often they they represent large large companies and industries, um, and a lot of a lot of uh, average citizens don't really have a voice in in coming up with those quote unquote effective solutions in Washington. So you know, which is why you see a lot of legislation that is basically written with. The health of lobbyists. Most lobbyists happen to represent corporations, so a lot of legislation is written with the help of corporate lobbyists in Washington. In our remaining minute, one other tweet from Gary who says Mitch McConnell was stupid to say out loud in 2008 what Democrats felt with the same vigor in 2000 when Bush was selected. Spare me the whining. Our last call is Lamar, East Chicago, Indiana. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Um, my question is, as far as extending the unemployment uh, benefits, it's been a problem um, as far as uh, 1.3 million people is not getting unemployment benefits. And I was trying to come up with some kind of solution for the for the, both Democrat and the Republic. If they can just maybe take a few more extra dollars, I don't know how possible that is as far as taking a few more dollars out for each week they get unemployment. Maybe that can go back into the budget. I don't know if that would help as far as financial, if, if finance is the real problem. Lamar, are you out of work at the moment? Uh, yeah, I am. Okay, so you're uh, one of those 1.3 million? Yes. Okay, we'll get a response. Thanks for the call. Um, you know, I mean, so this, you know, actually, I mean, you know, this is, this is the, the unemployment bill is, is, is a, you know, it has been an issue, a partisan issue. Although interesting, the, the Senate bill is a, is a bipartisanly introduced bill. Um, you know, uh, again, these are you know, I mean, the, the cause of the unemployment is 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 small when it comes to the the larger federal budget. I mean, it's a, it's a tiny tiny percent, but it's one of these issues that has been used on as a as a highly partisan issue because Democrats and Republicans have very different philosophies about how to deal with with unemployment. So certain issues. Tend to be amplified by by the the partisan battle, and this is one of those issues. Lee Drutman is a senior fellow at the Sunlight Foundation. You can get more information by logging on to sunlightfoundation.com. Thanks very much for adding your perspective to this issue. Thanks for having me here on a Sunday.